Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, not very often I will begin one of these videos with some work already shown to you, but uh, th this is uh, sort of preliminary, and we, uh, we, if I recall, we did this in class together anyway, at least to get to this point here. But we're talking about this thing called the work energy theorem. All right, we have a couple terms here we need to define, and one of them is the term work, and physics has uh, a very specific meaning for that. The other is, you know, term is energy, but uh, we're not just going to define energy because you might simply say, a physicist might simply say, well, energy is the capacity or ability to do work. Well, that doesn't help us much right now. Um, but there is a connection between work and energy in particular. Uh, right now, we're going to look at this uh, connection between what we call work and kinetic energy. So starting with this equation from kinematics relating velocities, acceleration, and displacement, uh, Newton's second law relates acceleration of an object to the force and to the mass of that object. So a quick substitution there for acceleration. And also, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure why, but typically this is um, rewritten with a D for distance. Uh, and that's okay, because we're talking about a distance that the object is traveling. Uh, so with those substitutions, basically I'm solving for force times distance. And the reason I want to solve for that is because force times distance is work. Uh, on the other side of the equal sign, uh, there's a number of ways to arrange these variables here, but typically it's written like this. So you have 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. And well, so, so it isn't quite a change in um, velocities because we have velocity squared and initial velocity squared. It's not a, it's not a delta v. It's a change in something else, from a final something to a minus an initial something, and the something is kinetic energy. So over here on the side, let me simplify this a little bit for you because we got these two new terms coming in. Okay, work. Now this is going to be a pain in your neck. But work is a capital W. With no vector symbol across the top of it, that would mean weight. And um, unfortunately, also, uh, the capital W is used elsewhere. Uh, we'll see pretty soon for the unit of watts, which is a measurement of power. OK, right now we mean work. So there's no number in front of it, so it's not a unit. And there's no arrow across the top of it, so it's not a force. It's work. Uh, the units are, well, if you look at force times distance, you have newtons times meters. So you say newton meter. You don't say newtons per meter. When you say the word per, that means there's a slash somewhere, and we don't have that. But physicists have termed this also uh, a joule. Or it is written. It's not like the, the blingy stuff you wear. It's spelled quite differently. But it's a joule. So the unit of work is the joule. One newton meter is one joule. And so, so here's the idea of the work energy theorem now. If you do work on an object by applying a force to it while the object moves a certain distance d, then you've done work and you have changed the kinetic energy of the object. Well, what's kinetic energy? Kinetic energy. OK. Um, usually, symbol capital K. Not always. Sometimes KE. That, that's fine, too. Uh, the unit here is, um, well, it's actually, well, if you look at what's going on, uh, basically, in its, in its shortest, simplest form. If an object has a velocity, and then if you square that velocity, multiply by the mass, and divide by 2, then you have a value equivalent to that object's kinetic energy. What would this be? Velocity squared is meters per second all squared, and then multiply by kilograms. So we have a kilogram meter squared per second squared. But physicists say, well, that's also a joule. One kilogram meter squared per second squared is a joule. 
Well, that makes sense because look, on the left we have joules, and on the right we have to have something equivalent to joules. It, it, you know, the left has to equal the right. Um, but I really haven't told you what kinetic energy is. Okay, well, it's, it's energy of motion. Think of it like that. Energy of motion. For kinetic energy. If an object is moving, it has kinetic energy. Because it has this, uh, it has a velocity. Um, if an object is at rest, it has zero kinetic energy. What if an object is moving in the negative direction? Well, you end up squaring it, and so you get rid of the negative value. Uh, there is no direction to kinetic energy. Uh, in fact, there's no direction to any kind of energy, really. It, it's not a vector quantity. It's a scalar quantity. Work. Work actually is the same thing. There isn't a direction uh, to work. It's not a vector. Uh, but there's this weird, strange property of work that you actually can have negative work. That doesn't imply a direction. Um, so that and it might be a small point in confusion. We'll see uh, uh, how negative work is going to come into play here and there. Okay, so we have work and we have kinetic energy. If we do work on an object, we are changing the kinetic energy of that object. So the work energy theorem, more or less, looks like this. Work equals change in kinetic energy. More or less, that's it. There's details left out, but uh, we can we can work with that as a, as, a, as a beginning for sure. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, I mentioned that kinetic energy can never be negative, but check this out. Can the change in kinetic energy be negative? Well, sure it can. Uh, if an object has an, a velocity zero later on, but in the beginning it had some non-zero velocity. Well, then um, it has zero kinetic energy in the end and it has some value of kinetic energy in the beginning and you end up with a negative value for the change even though the any individual kinetic energy cannot be negative. All right. So now what? Well, the thing about work, I want to focus more on the work side of it right now. We've seen the work energy theorem. That, that's sort of it. We're going to apply that work energy theorem um, quite a bit, but uh, let's focus on the work side of things for now, for now. All right, let's, uh, let's consider a box on a surface, and let's, let's say it's ideal, which means friction is, friction, I'm sorry, frictionless, and we apply a force. Force applied. Okay, and we're going to get this thing to move to there. So we have a distance traveled from there to there. So check this out. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's very easy. We have the force in a certain direction. We can call that the positive direction, if you like, positive x. And uh, we have the distance in that same direction, so they're parallel to each other. The force and the distance traveled are parallel quite easy, quite straightforward, but what happens, oh, and we can find the amount of work done. What happens, though, if we take that same object and we want to move it the same distance and we apply a, a force, maybe it's the same force, but now all of a sudden we push it like this. Then, uh, so we have a distance that so we've moved the object, same distance d. How much work have we done? Hmm, is it the same amount? The trick is this, for the force and the distance, to calculate work, they must be parallel. Symbol for parallel right there. And if they're not, as in, so if this is example one, this is example two, in example two, in this situation, we have to find the component of that force that is parallel. Okay, and short answer is there's an angle, and therefore we're going to take the angle between the force we're applying, and not necessarily the angle to that component. I mean, that's, that's going to be the component, but the angle between the force and the distance traveled. That's the important part. 
So we end up with FD cosine theta. And why cosine is because, well, the parallel component of the force is adjacent to that angle. Okay, this is how you're going to calculate work. Always incorporate this. What if theta is zero degrees? Then what do you get? Well, uh, cosine of zero is um, one. So you get the full force times distance. What if theta is, say, 45 degrees? Then cosine of 45, oh my gosh, that's, uh, what is that, radical two, right? Cosine of 45? Is that radical? No, that's not radical two. What am I doing? Cosine of 45. You get about point seven one uh, times force times distance. So you're getting a component here that is smaller than the actual force, and so the work you do ends up being less. You do less work because you're applying a smaller force. Um, okay, well, what, what, how about the extreme example? Cosine is 90 degrees. We're going to push on this box at an angle of 90 degrees right there. There's our force. And so this is right angles to the distance traveled. What's the cosine of 90? Well, that would be zero. You don't have any work done. This box might move, but the, that particular force is not doing any work on the box while it moves. We're going to calculate work done using that equation right there. Fd cosine theta. All right. So, well, what about an example? Let's check it out. A real example. Quantitative. Let me get... Uh, there we go. We'll wrap this up with this example. I have, oh, let me use a better color. This one, no. be easier to see this way. All right, we have a car. Let's, uh, doesn't really matter what the object is, right? Nice looking car. Now, uh, we have a car traveling in this direction. So we can see the velocities that way. Let's call that direction the positive direction. Okay. And, uh, well, it, let's say it's someone forgot to put on the parking brake and they got out and the car starts to roll forward. So maybe it's a slight downhill. Um, but or, or maybe, you know, some other weird scenario. And you got to get out and apply a force to this thing. And you're, you're, you've been working out, man. You're, you're, you're tough. You got this. So you're going to be here pushing on the car. You're applying a force at the car at, let's look at the point of contact here, at an angle. And let's call that angle, hmm, what angle will that be? Angle theta, here's your force applied. And uh, you're going to apply a force of, oh, let's give it a good one. You've been working out, 200 newtons. And theta... You're pushing down at this angle of, uh, I don't know, 20 degrees. And while you do this, your goal is to stop the car and get rid of that car's velocity. So the car is going to move from, uh, from here to here. There's our distance D. And let's say distance D is, uh, let's say it takes you 6 meters to stop this car. About 20 feet give or take. Uh, you, want, you want to protect your car, you want to protect everybody else, right? And so, there you go. You're, you're Superman, you're Superwoman, you're going to stop this car. Well, how much work did you do on the car? Okay. Work equals FD cosine theta. Okay, now this is very interesting. I have to look at this very carefully. It would be very simple for me to say, well, it's uh, cosine of 20 degrees times the distance times the force. But the situation is not quite so simple because, okay, the force I'm applying is down here. And that 20 degree angle, 
the way I've shown theta here is it actually shows up here. Okay. So that's where theta resides. That's my 20 degree angle, there's theta. But which way is the distance? So the distance, let me use the green for the distance again. The distance is actually in this direction. Now this is not really part of a, a, a proper way to do a free body diagram, but I want to show you this because my distance is there. Not a force. As soon as I've done that, I've sort of violated free body diagram rules. But that's not my goal here. I'm you know, just trying to figure things out. Now my question to you is, is theta really the angle between my force and my distance traveled? Mm, no, no it's not. The angle between the force and the distance traveled is actually this angle. Okay. So what do I call that? I can call it anything I want. Theta prime, just for, to give it some other name. And what is it? Well, if, if uh, you know, halfway around the circle would be 180, and then this theta is 20 degrees. So theta prime is 200 degrees. And there's a reason for that. I'll show you. Here we go. Let's calculate the work done. Well, you have a 200 newton force. You have a distance of six meters. You want to keep all your units in basic, um, uh, I guess you call it KMS units. So kilograms, meters, seconds, newtons um, for these calculations. You, you'll get, you get nicer answers usually. Cosine of theta. I got to do cosine of theta prime, don't I? Oop, I was supposed to write the number in there. 200 degrees. And I'm just going to multiply. Okay. So how much work is done? I've got 200 times 6 times 200 cosine equals. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All of a sudden I get a negative number. Negative 1,127 point stuff in. So I'm going to round to 28. Um, what are the units of work? I had newtons times meters, which is a newton meter, but a newton meter is equal to a joule. Okay, so here's the answer. And I can see I get negative work. I did negative work on that thing. Okay, negative work. Look at this. Look at the work energy theorem. I did negative work. What that means is the change in kinetic energy is negative. Okay, so the change of kinetic energy. I stopped the car. You stopped the car. You're, you're Supergirl, you stopped the car. And so uh, you sort of took away the kinetic energy of the car. It ended up with zero kinetic energy over here. The final was zero velocity. Here's your initial, at whatever that was. Um, you took it away. So the change in kinetic energy went from, well, if you do a final minus initial, your final is zero, your initial is some value, you're gonna have a negative change. Makes sense. Ah, okay. Now, now you can see the importance of looking at this angle between the force, oh, I should label force. Between the force and the distance, the angle and how you look at it matters. If I had just used 20 degrees, well, what would have happened? Uh, let's examine that real quick. If I do, FD cosine of regular theta. How much work do I do? Uh, I've got 200 newtons. I've got my 6 meters. And I've got cosine of 20 degrees. And my equal signs. Um, well, 200 times 6 times 20 cosine. Now I better hit the equal button. What, 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 what? 11, 2, 7 and stuff. So 8, what? Okay, the only difference is I get the, the minus sign, which, which is correct if I look at the angle correctly. If I look at the angle incorrectly, I get the right number, but I don't get the right sign. And having the sign on it, yes, that matters. Even though work is not a vector, there isn't really a direction to work, having that sign matters. Because of the work energy theorem, it matters. 
because I need to know if the change in kinetic energy is a positive change or a negative change. Therefore, I need to know if the work done is positive or negative. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Okay. Ooh, I should put a box around this guy because uh, those two are more or less the same thing. Short version, expanded version, same thing. Work energy theorem is real, real important. Uh, so this is an almost. That's a, that's a that's a thanks for trying. You almost got there. You have to look at the angle correctly. The actual angle between the force and the distance traveled. The distance would be a vector in this case. It's got to be. Okay, so that is how we calculate force acting force. Sorry, work acting. Uh, work done to an object. I, I got to get my, my brain in gear. The, sometimes the way we say these things matters. Let me run through this real quick and then I'm going to end this video. Um, an object, check this out, has velocity, yes? Or it has mass. Um, does an object have time? No, not really. Time passes. Time marches on, so this, so they say, right? Um, does an object have acceleration? Or would it be better to say an object experiences an acceleration? I don't know about that. You could argue that. Okay, does an object have kinetic energy? An object has kinetic energy. Is that proper wording? Well, I would say yes, it is. Objects can have an amount of energy. Um, do objects have work? Can an object? Can you say the object has work? No, that doesn't make a lot of sense. No, um, no. But so you say instead, work is done to or on an object. That's a better wording. That's much, much more appropriate, clearer. Okay, sorry about that, a uh, little extra credit, and, um, but I had to get that out. Work energy theorem, really, really important, really important. What we end up doing to an object, changing its velocity, uh, we are now starting to, to, to talk about the kinetic energy and the change in its kinetic energy. We produce that change in kinetic energy by doing work on the object. There's a lot more to come. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.